From courthouses to Congress, it has been a week crammed full of news. The Michael Flynn guilty plea today, momentum for the Republican tax plan, and increased calls for Congressman John Conyers to resign amid charges of sexual misconduct. All of that brings us to the analysis of Shields and Gerson. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and Washington Post columnist Michael Gerson. David Brooks is away. Welcome to both of you. So, Mark Shields, what a day uh, here in Washington. Uh, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, um, brought made news early today with this guilty plea from, from uh, retired General Michael Flynn, the president's uh, nas former national security advisor. What do you make of it? Uh, well, Judy, one uh, former federal prosecutor said that Michael Flynn was looking at several score years potentially uh, behind bars, the offenses that were listed against him. And for Robert Mueller to accept uh, his plea uh, of guilty uh, for this one charge of lying to the FBI, which is a very serious charge, uh, led him and, and all of his colleagues to conclude that this is big, uh, that uh, what he is delivering, he, Michael Flynn, uh, to Robert Mueller and his office um, is, is significant, so significant that they would uh, let his son off and apparently not proceed on the charges that Kerry had mentioned in the earlier segment about his not registering for work with Turkey his, uh, and the other charges against him. And, and uh, again, uh, Michael Gerson, the White House is saying that's all well and good, but that's just what Michael <coughs> Flynn did and it had nothing to do with anybody in this White House. It's not a particularly credible response at this point, I think. I mean, it did feel like a historic day. Um, um, this, when the history of the uh, Trump administration is written, I think Russia will be in the first paragraph. Um, and the reason is exactly what, what Mark was talking about, is that Mueller got something in order to give a considerable amount here. We don't really know what it is mm -hmm. that he got. It's, it, it's uh, still, uh, you know, undeterminate. Um, but he got something that he felt that he could bring to a grand jury and that would forward a case towards people who are higher. And there aren't too many other people who are higher. The group is small, and many of them are, you know, have the Trump family connection. Um, and so I, I think you, you can't argue that this is just restricted to him. He was turned in order to turn against others. Um, and I think that Mueller has a good idea of what that testimony will look like. And Mark, there still is, though, this drumbeat out there from people who say, wait a minute, there's just too much focus on this Russia investigation. We don't know where it's, where it's heading. It's taking up a lot of time and energy. And what does it add up to? Well, I, I think what it adds up to, Judy, is that uh, when it's been compared, Michael Flynn today, to John Dean at the time of Watergate, uh, who in Richard Nixon, he had been White House counsel. And when John Dean came clean, um, it wasn't Bob Haldeman, the chief of staff in the White House, or, or uh, John Ehrlichman, who was domestic policy advisor, the two people closest to President Nixon, uh, they had in sight. And I mean, I don't think there's any question uh, that unspoken is that the president's in sight. And the speculation all day today in Washington is what will President Trump do? I mean, will he, in fact, as uh, the walls start to close in, or apparently seem to close in on him, uh, will he fire Robert Mueller? Um, Lindsey Graham, in anticipation of that, the center of South Carolina, uh, urged him not to do it, warned him not to do it. Uh, what will the Republicans do? Um, you know, Paul Ryan has right. praised him. The Speaker of the House was recently is stronger than any president since Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, realizing that flattery gets you everywhere with this president. But uh, so I, I don't know. But that that is quite frankly where it is. It, it is it is serious. It's real. Uh, it's genuine. And and Bob Mueller is not playing games. He's not a partisan. Uh, he was appointed by uh, President George W. Bush at the FBI, um, and uh, he's, you know, he's he's a guy who's way above any kind of cheap party politics. Michael, does it inexorably lead to the president? Well, it leads to a very basic question: is why has everyone that touched this issue lied, <laughs> lied to the FBI, lied to the American public? Um, 
you know, if they were just having normal contacts with a with a normal power, you know, with a, another power, that's what transitions do. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came down to it, and you know, this is advice for our viewers at home: you don't lie to the FBI, um, mm -hmm. and that that is a dangerous thing because every lie is leverage for them. They use it in order to get more information to make progress in their investigation, and so they're attracting attention to the mystery at the center of this uh, matter by their deceptions, and that, it seems like we're dealing with something very major. And Judy, if I could just pick up on Michael's point, which I think is a good one. And, and what we do know is this, uh, that uh, after the election, uh, during the interregnum, the transition, when Michael Flynn was out of government, uh, but working uh, in the transition, about to be named National Security Advisor, he, uh, it, it, to really uh, frustrate and overcome uh, veto American foreign policy legitimately and legally made by the sitting President of the United States, Barack Obama, to impose sanctions upon Russia for Russia's meddling and sabotaging the American election, got in touch with uh, Ambassador Kislyak, the former then ambassador to from Russia, and urged him not to retaliate uh, and and not to uh, overreact or, or whatever to, to these sanctions. And we know that the next day uh, that uh, Russia did not, and the day following that, Donald Trump praised Russia right. for the uh, for, for its restraint in not retaliating. It was known that that so, was his position that he wanted that was his better position. That's he wanted better relations. That's with right, Russia. but that but but the uh, the sequence it, it's it's it, in other words it's impossible to believe that Michael Flynn was acting on his own that he was a lone ranger that that this was not part of uh, it, and the sequence is there that it, you know it's it just you go to sleep at night and the the ground is bare you wake up in the morning and it's there's three four inches of snow. You didn't see it snow, but the snow on the ground and the circumstantial evidence is pretty persuasive. The other big story today, Michael Gerson, is what we talked to Lisa Desjardins about. Is uh, the the speaking of inexorable, this tax plan is it moved through the House. It was passed. It's now about to be passed by every every good reporter's uh, uh, reporting. It's going to pass the Senate right. tonight. What does this say about the, the Republican Party and how it wants to change this economy? Yeah, well, there's some drama to this. Last night, when the Joint Tax Committee report came out saying that this would add a trillion dollars to the debt, mm -hmm. and uh, Corker essentially said, I can't support these thing, this thing, it looked like it might be a near-run thing. Mm -hmm. But M McConnell gave a lot of people what they wanted, like Senator Collins sure. and others in this process. Um, ultimately, there weren't even three true deficit hawks in the entire Republican caucus. There was one, <laughs> which was Corker. I mean, all this you know, talk about deficits really was, was undermined. But the ultimate cal calculation here that Republicans have made broadly on the Hill is that if they do not end up the year with nothing, that they will be politically punished. And their argument is that something is better than nothing, even a flawed product like this one. Um, that, and uh, I don't know if that's a correct argument, but that is generally believed on Capitol Hill among Republicans. Are they taking a risk by doing this? They're, they're taking a risk, Judy, that they're, they're losing any sense of integrity. Uh, I mean, this is a, a tax bill that's written solely for the deserving rich. Um, and uh, it also, at the same time, manages to soak the poor. Um, it just the Joint Committee on Taxation and the Congressional Budget Office indicates that it, by 2027, by 2027, Americans earning the princely sum of f between forty and fifty thousand dollars will collectively combine pay five point three more b trillion trillion dollars more in taxes. Americans earning over one million dollars by the same study will receive five point seven trillion dollars in tax cuts. I mean, the Republican Party, uh, for the longest time, and Michael was a, 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 a card, was a card-carrying member of it, uh, believed in small government, limited government, uh, in uh, in balanced budgets, um, and th then they drank the Kool-Aid of uh, of supply side, uh, and no Republican on Capitol Hill since 1991 has voted since George W. Bush, H. W. Bush was president, has voted to increase taxes. That is the holy grail. 
That's the one unifying, galvanizing principle of Republicans. It's not, it's not civil rights as it once was in the time of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's not even small government. Uh, and it's not certainly balanced budgets. It is tax cuts. And it's tax cuts for those best off among us. But, but to get back to your point, I mean, and to build on what Mark just said, Michael, this says that Republicans are not, either they don't believe the deficits are going to grow or they don't think it's going to be the political liability or the liability to the economy. Yeah, and, and they don't think that it's a risk to be seen as the plutocratic party going into these elections. That may well be a risk here. I mean, one of the examples is that Senator Rubio and Senator Lee had a very good proposal here to allow the child tax credit to be deductible against um, withholding, mm -hmm. not just income taxes, which would really help blue-collar, working-class families mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. um, it was deeply controversial, still up in the air, what, what's going to happen. But that's not where Republicans were. I mean, they're supposed to be now the populist party, the party of, of, of uh, blue-collar workers. And they were not, at least uh, as of the moment, willing to do something like this. Um, and that, I think, is a, is a test that Republicans are failing if they want to be seen as populists in the mode that, that Trump wants the party to be seen. They need to act like it. But it, and it looks, Mark, as if uh, there's no question that the House is going to go along with something. They're going to, there'll be changes, but in the end, there will be a tax bill. I, I think there will. And, and I don't think Democrats ought to skate on this, Judy, because the Democrats have let the debate become about the deficit, which means this. If the Republicans do lose the House in 2018, and if the calculations and calibrations are accurate, then when the Democrats get back in, they're going to be beset with enormous deficits, and their responsibility is going to be to Cut, do the cuts or raise, or raise ta and raise taxes. Um, and, and let's be very honest about this. There is part of this is the Grover Norquist uh, ideal, the Republican strategist, conservative strategist, and that is you sh have to shrink the government. Kevin Brady, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, has already said that the next move is on welfare. We have to cut welfare. Welfare means one thing. It mean, means three things. It means Medicaid. It means Medicare, and it means disability and Social Security. And uh, the Democrats, like the Republicans on health care, did never have a plan. The Democrats did not have a single organizing principle that they advanced instead of. Uh, they, they, and, I, and I think that was a failure of Democratic leadership. But it sounds, Michael, as if Republicans are prepared to make that argument. Yeah, no, I agree with that. They could even, they, there's a possibility that the House might vote on the Senate bill and avoid conference here, um, right. which, uh, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, because some members of the House might not want it to happen. Um, but I think that they want to move in this direction as fast as they can, and they're going to tag the Democrats with that type of argument. So. Just less than a minute. John Conyers, longest-serving uh, Mark member of the House, 88 years old, accused of sexual misconduct, credible charges against him. He's holding out on saying he's going to step down, but it now looks like he will. Um, what does this say? It says, Judy, it's a, it knows no partisanship. It knows no occupational. Uh, it is a, it's endemic in our society. Um, and uh, what, what had been a, a high road politically, quite bluntly for the Democrats, uh, ceased to be uh, by the way that this was mishandled uh, by uh, the leader of the Democratic Party on public te on national television questioning who are the witnesses, uh, something that uh, obviously uh, is not been the Democrats' approach in the Roy Moore case in Alabama, uh, where he stands accused of child molestation. It is taking longer for those who've been accused in politics than it has been for those in other uh, fields of endeavor, like the news media and other places where people's they don't, they don't say, jobs have, have, have been taken away immediately. I agree, but they don't face the collective liability that NBC faces for, for apparently complicit or allegedly complicit behavior in the Matt Lauer. Mark Shields, Michael Gerson, thank you both.